Hi there. Welcome to Microbology Journal Club, where we nerd out big about all things small. My name is Danny. In a previous life, I dropped out for my PhD in microbiology. Then I was a fact checker and editor for pharmaceutical advertisers. Nowadays, I'm a member and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC dedicated to the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz. I have a PhD in microbiology and I've mostly worked on bacteria, but I've also worked in research integrity and I'm currently working for a scientific journal. Uh, every other week, we've been meeting to talk about microbiology and our typical day like today, we do an overview of some of the coolest microbiology papers that we've seen in the last two weeks. Well, four, four weeks in this sense. <laughs> yes. And, and usually we go back to you to maybe ask to select a paper to do a deep dive on. So make sure to message us through any one of the social media apps in the deep doobly doo and we'll see if we can uh, make a video about something that's caught your fancy. Yes. Um, you can follow along with the papers that we discuss. Uh, in our shared Zotero library. And uh, as Faz said, all of those relevant links are linked in the doobly-doo below. And we want to hear from you. So please use comments or, or tweet us or uh, mammoth us. I can't remember what it is. Uh, <laughs> via the, the social Toot, media apps. Tooting. Tooting. <laughs> tooting, that's what it is. <laughs> so yeah, what kind of papers do we have today, Danny? Um, all right, so the five things that I found is a report on uh, bacteria in our, all of our skin crevices, um, this bioinformatics approach, uh, but also a little bit of uh, molecular biology looking at nucleus-based phages. Um, then we have switching up the mode of cell division based on the size of prey. That's a Bedello, a Bedello Vibrio. Uh, Biocement oh, yeah. bacteria from cave crud and uh, directed evolution on co-cultures. Co and not only that, can SARS-CoV-2 fuse your brain? Can gene therapy be used to spay cats? And how can we talk to viruses to make sure that they understand how to, to kill cancer properly? And uh, can genetically engineered bacteria dance to ultrasound? And how can we make a failed antibiotic work? Uh, all that and, and more. So feel free to, to stay tuned. Um, let's go yeah. on without further ado on to our first paper which is titled uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and viral fusogens called cause neuronal and glial fusion that compromises neuronal activity. Yeah, so we all know that, that, that we all have kind of accepted by now that SARS can have uh, neuronal symptoms. I mm. mean, we've explored like I, the idea of it can infect brain cells because there are very various neurons that express ACE2 and NRP1. Um, mm. But the, the question is, like, what kind of brain damage do we get in there? And this paper looks into, yeah. into like, viral fusion. So uh, when a virus enters a cell, it has to, like, fuse with a membrane. And I think the idea, and, and then when they enter the cell, uh, th those things can still be on the surface. And when it's, especially when it's about to make more virus, they, those fusions start poking up, and that can cause it to, the cell to fuse with adjacent cells. Mm -hmm. And so we see that in the young, in the lungs, as respiratory syncytia. And the idea of this paper is perhaps that can happen to neurons. Yeah, um, it's it, it it derives from the function of the spike protein. Like the spike protein is meant to fuse the virion to cells. And so in the production of spike protein on the surface of cells, it could also potentially have cells themselves fused together uh, into these big blobs. And I feel like we've talked about some of these of, of this before, like um, when we were looking at like what's the difference between Omicron and things that came before it. I think one of the mm. things that people saw was like, oh, it was better at doing some cell fusion, like right, just because of different mutations that happen on the spike. So like this has always been a feature that we knew about with um, SARS-CoV-2, but I think the the interesting part of this paper is they're going to you know try to figure out does it happen in the brain, and they really trot out a whole bunch of different cell-based models, um, I think, to, to try to show what's going on. Yeah, they use a lot of the, the, those mini-brains, I think we've heard, heard a fair bit about. Um, yes. The, uh, organoids. So you, yes, organoids. They're, they're like, they grow from stem cells, and they look like brains, and they act like brains, but not too much like mm -hmm. brains, to make, so they're not unethical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's actually, I, I, uh, somebody came to t speak about those ones at the lab, and they talked about, like, there are, like, these guidelines to say, like, how developed are they getting? Because in some cases, they are making them from human cells. Um, and so, like, it, it's kind of crazy that, that that sort of ethical sci-fi place has to be addressed explicitly in, 
in the research protocols of people that work with um, human cells in these organoids. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's always good to have that preparation just in case you're doing a much better job than you're expecting to. Because I don't think mm -hmm. any, mm -hmm. yeah, just, I don't think anyone's expected to make a human level brain in, in a jar. Um, but without further ado, like, so, um, so they do some, a bunch of like different, like small ex experiments where they look at, so mm -hmm. here we've got like a, a couple of like some microscopy uh, showing uh, cells. I think they've got like a, a dye that comes into cells and the dye flows mm -hmm. into another cell as they fuse together. So we've got the, the cell up top. That's when, that's the first one that goes for it. Um, I'm using very scientific terms by going like, I think, <laughs> but what? But yeah, I'm... Uh, <laughs> Right. So, so they when they use they use mice. They they do this. This paper has like a big progression. I feel like they start off with like mouse cell culture, then they move to like human cell culture, then they move to human organoids. Right. It's like this whole progression trying to get more complicated. But for the mouse model they use, they have to, and and they're also not specifically interested in SARS-CoV-2. I think it, it's they're really selling the paper as more in general viral fusogens because there's some other virus yeah. that also makes. Uh, Oh, that Primate. can also infect the yeah neural cells, but um, uh, and makes a different fusogen. Yeah, so they've yeah, got sorry, like you know. a primate uh, s s virus that has a much better fusogen than SARS-CoV-2 because the with the primate with the primate version, it's this protein called R18 or R19. I I can't. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, can't I need to zoom in my notes because I am my. <laughs> My eyesight's not very good anymore. Uh, P15, that's what it is. Uh, <laughs> P15, it's yeah. from the baboon orthorrhea virus, which infects the brain of these primates and causes a mening meningoencephalomyelitis. Uh, that's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. um, and this region doesn't need, you can just like bind directly with membranes. With, with, with like SARS CoV 2, the spike needs to bind to ACE2 in order for it to fuse. So that's kind mm -hmm. of a limiting factor for it. Uh, so that's almost like you've got this other primate virus acting as a positive control, as something to show the worst case scenario. And then you've got SARS somewhere on the way and kind of looking at how that works. And I think the next place mm -hmm. they start testing is in, uh, they, they start going into like places like C. elegans as well. Um, so again, this is like showing a, a glial cell. And, and the interesting thing is also like it shows, this one kind of shows like little punctate nuclei that I think could be uh, mitochondria or other organelles that are traveling. They usually travel along the length of the neural cell, and they're very important mm -hmm. for making sure that, that messaging happens because there's, and uh, and the idea is that once these cells fuse, those can fuse as well, and it can help the virus uh, spread between cells uh, without mm -hmm. even like, um, so you can see like this entire network of fused uh, neuron cells. <laughs> Yeah, because only one of those cells got the dye, and then so as they begin to fuse, that dye transmits between between the cell bodies. Yeah, and then we they also look at neuronal activity. So these are, are markers that this is like kind of showing that that the the once the cells start fusing, they start synchronizing their their like move their their depolarizations. So the mess the mm. way that they message each other is changed and somewhat damaged. So it, it kind of it alters. <laughs> I mean, somewhat damaged sounds like uh, like clearly damaged. Like they're not supposed to be all in synchrony. They're supposed to be having their own <laughs> doing their own processing or whatever. Yeah. So it's so again, these are images of that kind of depolarization. And I unfortunately I'm not a neuroscience, so I don't really I can't really interpret it, what these these potentially mean. But uh -huh. I think, but I'm sure that it means that the brain activity is unusual. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, they don't have these are cell culture stuff, right? So it's like extrapolation, saying like if this was happening inside of inside of our brains, then it wouldn't be good. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> I think. Uh, it, so let me like bring back the paper quickly. Uh, let me do that. Uh, uh, but yeah, um, so it's an interesting paper from that perspective because because with uh, SARS-CoV-2, you are seeing a lot of like neuronal sy symptoms with it, and I think yeah, I think this is one of those trying to find, trying to explore what we know of SARS-CoV-2 in order to explain those post-acute sequelae, as well as neuronal symptoms. Um, yeah, and so I guess this could be a part of it. 
I feel like they also tried in figure three of the paper. Um, they also tried to like, again, they're trying to speak maybe more generally about viral fusogens in neural cells and trying to say that it could even fuse just like, right, these neurons are really long. They have like a big cell body and then they have a trailing axon or whatever. And they were saying like, oh, you can even get like fusion of just like the tips of the, the neurites at the end of the axons, they could fuse there. And so like, like it's not, you don't have to think of it as necessarily this, like, like the whole cell is, it's just like these small little connections, but that's enough to change a lot of stuff and, and stuff can flow through those connections, I think is what they're also trying to show. Like these small areas, like neurons by necessity are touching each other in close proximity. And then so having some of these fusogen proteins like manifest on that membrane can get them to join and then you know then the cytoplasm is joined and that just means bad signaling events <laughs> i remember like learning in school that the signaling like speed is dependent on those gaps being present because there's almost an electromagnetic effect that happens at, that, at those points so fusion... yeah there's a i think they release that's where they release the neurotransmitters yeah right, the synapses <clears throat> um so, so yeah is that, is that what you want to say about this one? That's what I was going about... to say about the paper. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's, for me, what, what sort of stri struck me about this is they're doing a lot of work in like the cell culture elements of it, and um, they try to get it more complicated. At the end of the day, if, if they're, so they, with the organoids, they don't do anything artificial in terms of, Ex, uh, explicitly trying to get ACE2 on other cells or neuropilin 1 on other cells. So they are just relying on whatever the differentiation model is, right, that gives them this complex organoid structure. Um, they're getting a whole bunch of cell types that do end up having some fusion. So, like, that's sort of the best, right, analogy that they can bring mm. into the human body saying, like, oh, well, we probably have these cell types as well, right? So we can think of that as perhaps happening inside of us. Um, yeah. Don't get SARS-CoV-2. You still don't. <laughs> still not good yeah, to get it. <laughs> no good. Don't. If, if you can help it. No good. Yeah. If you can help it. <laughs> All yeah. right. Let's move on. Next thing yep. we got is durable contraception in the female domestic cat using viral vector delivery of a feline anti-malurian hormone transgene. Yeah, this is a wild. fascinating paper. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so essentially, uh, there are a lot of like free roaming domestic cats in the world, and it's a big problem, especially if you're a small bird or a rare ex a animal. That is, that <laughs> yeah, a small, a taste, a taste, a small tasty animal for for cats. Yeah. So, I mean, there, you can spay and neuter your pets, but that requires you going, to, them having surgery, and it's. Quite, it can be take quite a lot, but what if you could do it with just one injection? I mean, I think that's the idea for. An, I also think that paper. like the spay and neutering technique, at least in New York City, there's like this volunteer core of like cat trappers, and they like or they catch wild cats and then submit them to to surgery so that they don't reproduce. And so like that's like um that's quite it's quite a difficult task actually. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, and actually hilariously enough, I also think it is like this um. It's like a wildlife exposure sort of mechanism too. Like the more people doing the cat trapping, the more you're also getting scratched by cats <laughs> and whatever yeah. like wild cats have, <laughs> uh, feral cats are, are bringing in. So yeah, I can sort of see the utility of having some sort of virus do the sterilization. Um, but of course it's also like, to me, it just also sounds like kind of spooky <laughs> to have like a virus yeah. deliver this hormone, which in the paper, they say it's a mammalian thing, right? Like it, it works. Yeah. It's a, it's a mammals thing. So like I don't like like we're also mammals, right? And they're specifically yeah, it, using like a mouse one at the beginning, um, and showing that 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 it works, or that that the cat one works in mice rather. Yeah. So anti mammalian hormone is is a member of this uh, ligands that is crucial for like sex determination in female, and it tends to be ex like. It tends to be shown on like feline ovaries and and follicles. So the idea is that if you have a have like a gene therapy that that makes the immune system not like the, those systems, it can generate antibodies that will cells and stop the su suppress the uh, follicular genesis and prevent and like prevent eggs from being made. 
mm-hmm. and cause and induce a permanent contraception. So they use like uh, an adenosucleated uh, kind of gene into like the muscles of the of the the mouse, and this is a replicating virus as well. So the idea is that this virus keeps replicating in the muscles of the animal, and eventually it will uh, s- s- produce like enough of this uh, product to cause the, the suppression of the uh, of well, not all of estrus, but just the part of estrus that is related to like the release of eggs. Um, yeah, yeah. Wait, and it's not. Uh, they don't. It's not that they're trying to raise antibodies against this hormone. It's the oh, hormone yeah, itself, right, right. right? That's interacting. I think. I think they do measure antibody levels against the hormone. That's a really common sort of thing where it's like, oh, you're making a lot of something strange that could potentially backfire because your body will start suppressing it. Uh, that it's makes like that's a very sense. common. Yeah, that's a really common assay in. Um, uh, hemophilia, right? Because like a, a hemophilia, it's a lot about delivering like these factor mm. eight or whatever, right? Clotting factors into the body. So like um, the the way to study that to make sure it's working is to measure antibody levels. If you have too many antibodies, then the way you're delivering that factor eight isn't good because it's immunogenic, and, and you just want it to do the thing it normally does in the body. <laughs> yeah. So they express yeah. AMH in the muscles, and that changes mm-hmm. the way the the hormones work. Um, right. Yeah. And this paper is like almost more of a, like a cat, cat, cat biology paper in that way, right? Because they sort of measure a lot of different hormone levels to get a sense of how is this extra AMH influencing the development of eggs. Um, yeah. And they go through so, yeah. like some iterations. So the first iteration, they use like a, an incomplete version of the cat genome. And they found it, uh, it only worked in maybe one or two of the cats. Um, uh-huh. Because they, they try, they they name the cats, which is like uh, it makes me feel <laughs> feel bad. Like, but yeah, they yeah. so they got like one female like Antilles, uh had um, retained like high serum AMH protein levels, and uh, and I think they found that, that essentially that there was a variable like level of expression because these weren't quite the right structure of proteins, and it turns out they need to go. We need to wait for a better version of the genome to come out in order to find a, a more, a version of this treatment that would work long term. And right, they do like a barrel of different tests to like look at chest hormone levels and test what's going on. And in the end, that they the main test is to to put them in a box with a male cat and then uh-huh. s- a and proven how, a proven breeder. <laughs> a proven breeder, yeah. <laughs> and and they like tested to see whether this cat can breed breed kittens from, from these animals right. compared to the control. And and compared to the control, yeah, they the it seemed to work like like it seemed to work hundred percent of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, the yeah, one and- thing about Sorry. Oh, I just want to say um, what I found interesting about this was that I didn't realize cats are like they have like induced over uh, like induced egg uh, maturation so like it's the act of having sex sometimes that is instigating the development of uh these ova and so like what right. they noticed in the cats that had received the gene this gene therapy is that they just they they rebuff the attempts to try to copulate um yeah. right so like there's there's some interplay here with behavior as well um, and how that, yeah, how that influences the development of um, fertile eggs. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that this very interesting paper. The one thing that I wish they test checked just for my own mental well-being is to see like whether this whether this virus was transmissible between cats, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because there is a. Because cats, there are like various wildcat populations which which are which inter- interbreed with domestic cats, mm-hmm. and so putting and they're already endangered. So the risk of this kind of spreading into wild population and then eventually maybe making it to humans, I don't know how. But the we're on the internet. There are weird people out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So the, I feel like the we. This could be a, a doomsday device if <laughs> it's in the wrong hands. Um, so just want to just make sure it can't get transmitted. Yeah, which I mean, in some ways, is that the segue into the next paper, <laughs> right? Like, like yeah. what's the safety really of, of this sort of thing? Especially uh, considering that the the hormone is like for mammals. I don't know. That really got me. Like, I'm just like, you know, what's what's going on here? 
Um, but that's a good segue because like, yeah, transmissibility, if it's a replicating virus inside of the organism, if, you know, they can express this um, hormone in whatever tissues it ends up getting into, those are all like barriers that we would like some control over. And so um, segue into the next paper. <laughs> yeah, synthetic virology approaches to improve the safety and efficacy of oncolytic virus therapies. So a lot of like, so this is kind of, for bouncing off of that, where the idea is, is quite a lot of virus therapies out there to try and treat cancers. And mm -hmm. there is like a concern about making sure that, that when a virus is killing a cancer, it, it doesn't, so a lot of them like say produce a chemokine or a cytokine, which in high doses can be worse than the, can like, can actually be quite- Yeah, especially if body. it's, and if it's circulating, I mean, yeah. I think, yeah, we'll look at right after this, the idea, and, and we've looked at it before, right? Like the idea of trying to localize the bacteria that are making these things into the tumors is one way to sort of get at this. Yeah. Um, but here, but here they're talking not about bacteria, they're talking about like specific, uh, yeah, they're talking about viruses, yeah. oncolytic viruses too. Yeah. They're talking about like, so here they're using uh, the vaccinia virus to, to try and kill tumors. But the thing it's a big thing, DNA virus with tons of cofactors. It's a this is a big virus. Yeah, it's a it's one of the, the bigger, virus. more complicated viruses, uh, which means that there are a lot layers of regulation. It has almost its own like kind of metabolism that it implants into cells. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So it so that because of that, it's got many levers that, that people can use to control it. So mm -hmm. the idea is that we have these genes that can, say, produce uh, a um that can kill off the cancers but we don't necessarily want the virus to produce all those poisons immediately because that'd just be as bad as normal chemotherapy we'd want them to basically target tumors and then produce these these uh these products when we want them to and the idea here is they're testing out different inducers so the idea is you have these genes but they'll only be activated if you give a, a second drug to to someone and then that drug will find its way to the virus and then the virus will produce whatever poison it is to destroy the tumor. Right. Um, I, I mean, I, I didn't read too much into these oncolytic viruses, but it also sounded like that some of them just do, like some it, some of these viruses are just anti-cancer in general. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that true? Is it? Did you dive into it a little bit more? I dived into it. I didn't really, I feel like... Like, is it always a transgene payload that they have to be delivering? Or is it also just like, yeah. I think it's usually there's a transgene payload or sometimes they just go like activating the virus properly so making sure that the mm -hmm. the so i think activating the lytic phase of the virus perhaps but right because they do they do they talk don't... about that in the paper is what i saw right like there's yeah. this trade-off like between the regular pathogenicity of the virus and then having that virus like replicate all over the place um, yeah and so like they do like one of the reasons of having the switch is like not just the transgene but also just growing up the virus, right? You don't want that virus to be growing at all times. Um, and you would rather it grow only in the presence of this particular drug that they're adding in. <clears throat> yeah, yeah it, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So the, so most of this is testing out gene circuits. So they look at various like products that you could use as drugs. So things like uh, rapamycin and rapamycin derived compounds. Mm -hmm. uh, they also look <laughs> Which at- Which has like a uh, hilarious, <laughs> has a hilarious name. Rapalog, <laughs> yeah, <Rapamycin> and analogs. <laughs> yeah, uh, they they also have like various things called like doxycycline as well, and also uh, Cumate, and the uh, which is a product. Cumate is a product I've never heard of before, but mm -hmm. it's this one because it's like the one the one that isn't a, an actual drug in its own right. Because with doxycycline and rapamycin, I think that those are actual drugs that have their own effects. And for something like this, yeah, something, absolutely. Yeah, you'd want something that has as little effect as possible. So you can, at least for for research purposes, you just want to isolate what's going 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 on with the virus on its own. Um, mm -hmm. So at this point, the the thing they're trying to measure is leakiness and activity of the pro promoters. And they go through a couple of different like ways to do that. And I'm not going to go through in much detail, but and they also like combine these chemogenetic switches. So the idea of like having one that that oper that activates the gene a little bit, and then another one that adds on that activates it more. So it kind of you can not just like tell the tell the virus to produce a drug, but also tell it to produce more in a certain situation. 
uh, to up the dosage, if it were, as it were. Um, and, and yeah, and then they go down to like re regulating the control of its replication and spread within. Uh, so actually having a, a, a promoter specifically within the vaccinia virus so you can control how often it, it replicates. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's really interesting. The idea, because we don't really have this with, with drugs where the where with viruses, they are living things. And the idea here is to try and control how they work in order to make them better at being treatments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was it's it is quite interesting. I, I also hadn't really thought about, well, I, I don't think we've ever covered like people using Vaccinia virus as the biotech platform. For, for delivery no. of things. And so like, there's a lot that this, this is like kind of like a whole other place that I'm like, I don't even know what to think about. Like, what are the concerns with vaccinia virus knowing that it can do all these different things and have all these factors. So just to clarify, like in the last paper, like they were using adeno associated virus, right? Yeah. Like, that's that's a, like a, a very, or at least to me, it's a very well-known um, vector for getting genes yeah. into things. This one is like, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a whole new world of viral platform. And it's nice to see that they are putting some effort into figuring out how to control that better, especially considering, I think, the complexity of this virus. And maybe because its genome is bigger, it also is more amenable to adding in all these extra genes and things uh, yeah. to, to do this type of regulation, where, where you couldn't add all this machinery into like a smaller, um, a smaller viral platform. Yeah, that's the thing we don't talk about, about the size limit for viruses. Uh, there's only so much genetic code you can fit in a virus. Mm -hmm. And so having a larger virus means you can add more stuff. And mm -hmm. vaccinia is huge. So you can add a, and it's, you can add a lot of genetic code and a lot of machinery into it without, mm -hmm. without having and, to worry about the size limit. Yeah, and it's a DNA virus. I think that's also, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, there's so many different viruses. But yeah, the fact that it's a double strand DNA is also very helpful from how we understand these things. <clears throat> yeah. And the thing I quite like about, I think this is a great idea for like almost a research platform to test the efficacy of say, of like a, a chemokine or various parts of the immune system to see how, so the idea you can infect a virus into a specific area and then you can time when that, that cytokine is released so that you can see how the immune system responds in real time. And you can kind of, put, there's, there's almost an extra thing, aspect of learning to this, which is, which is quite exciting for me. I mean, there, I think um, there's all sorts of aspects to this, like adding adding like the dependency on the concentration of some drug also means you can change tropism because those drugs yeah. may go to different organs or accumulate in different places at different levels. And so, right, like that's another <laughs> another way that it can be impacted, can impact, yeah. Yeah, so I think this is a really fascinating uh, technology. And it's an interesting way to think about how how to control viral like oncolytic therapies. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, cool. I think that's what I was going to say about that. All right. Um, Up next, oh, we have this one in vivo I, programmable I like acoustic acoustic manipulation of genetically engineered bacteria. So we talked about gas vesicles a couple episodes ago. And then here's an application of gas vesicles making bacteria able to be manipulated by ultrasound. <laughs> yeah, this is a so uh, I don't know if you've so like ultrasound it it affects different me so it it's the differences between media that it really has an effect on. So yeah. like when like like so density like when sound, density. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in this case the the difference in density relative to the the mediums so because because mm -hmm. with because we, I think we've talked about acoustic tweezers maybe in the past. I think we usually look at optical tweezers, but yeah, I don't think we have. Tweezers... I don't. Because oh, right. It sounds like acoustic tweezers are like something quite new and, and difficult to use because because in biology systems you don't often have like <laughs> when you're having stuff floating around a liquid, you're not necessarily having a density difference between those two things. Yeah, uh, it's so like I've experienced this uh, with micro bubbles. The idea that if you if you uh... if you implant micro bubbles into like something you can actually like move those micro bubbles around because they are so different from the re so the there was this idea of using those as a drug target but mm -hmm. uh this is more interesting than that because instead you're basically creating like these nano bubbles inside of bacteria that you can use to drag them around places 
It's more and interesting because it's a order of magnitude different <laughs> like, from micro to nano. Is that, is that... It's, it's more interesting because it has bacteria in it, Danny. <laughs> and I like bacteria. I don't know if you didn't realize from this show that we created. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, no, yeah, the whole no, synthetic, it's, it's... The synthetic platform-ness of it is really fascinating. That, like, again, the bacteria are like a chassis that they're able to change the density of so that it can be manipulated. By, by these um, by these things, and it really harkens back to um, the cy. I think we talked about some weird cyborg bacteria where they coated it with mag with something magnetic, and they were using magnets oh, yeah. to try to move the, things around. The magnet paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the thing about the magnet paper is that they the because if you remember, they the way they would manipulate they had to make these magnetic bacteria they could manipulate in vivo, but it, well, in like kind of vitro. Mm -hmm. But when they had to put in a mouse, they literally had to put the mouse on top of a magnet where the tumors were in order for the magnets to get there. Mm -hmm. And this has kind of that same kind of energy, except they try to be a lot more like precise with it. And so they've got, so there's like several layers. There's the bacteria with the gas vape vesicles and then thing like transducer, which is like, which, oh, which is almost this array of different ultrasound uh, beacons that kind of send off these sounds to, to batter the bacteria in certain directions. <laughs> I think um, transducer is the name of the object that sends out ultrasounds. Yeah, that's and so like they they made it like an array of transducers that you know gives them some control over where the signals are going. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, there's uh, a movie. So let's so we can they've actually like got some helpful videos to like show some of this in action. So firstly, trapping. So here they just have a transducer that is focused in on one area, and it. And it basically like tells normal E. coli, but all, but accumulates uh, normal gas vesicles of E. coli. So this is in a normal media, and so the gas vesicles of E. coli just end up going to one area, and then they can use it to to steer it. So uh, so on one end we've got this array phase, which that just shows what the array is doing, what kind of sounds it's, it's sending out. Then it shows the acoustic field that's being generated, and then it shows where the bacteria are going. Uh, so they can move these bacteria around with music, with sound. Uh, this... <laughs> with music. <laughs> Sorry, my mind was on like, yeah, what else gets moved by sound? Well, dancing. And they got, and then they test it like moving in different directions. So here they have it moving up and down in this A shape, uh, which is right, which is really cool. Um, and, and I think that the the application they're imagining in and what they will take it to is like getting in blood vessels, right? Like yeah. this means that they could pilot pilot boluses of bacteria through blood vessels to put maybe the tumor right i think is the thought process yes yeah. i mean this is cool they get like bacteria spinning around in a vo vortex uh just to so yeah just like moving bacteria is is pretty cool and and yeah they try out all, and yeah like you said next thing they do is they put into blood vessels and this is through an experiment where they literally take a mouse like oh open up a little bit of it, put it under a cup and put a microscope on it, and then you can, s and then they, like, inject it with these bacteria into its bloodstream, and they have this one area of the bloodstream where they input their, their field, and that just draws the, the back, that, like, traps bacteria within them. And then once you've trapped the bacteria, you can uh, move it around. So here we've got, like, normal E. coli, gas feasible E. coli, and now we can, we can trap them in one place. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we, we get, they can do some really gnarly stuff now with the, these groups of bacteria, uh, where they can just manipulate it to move up and around this blood vessel. I mean, it's it's wild. That it's like a crazy. But yeah, but you said that this is dissected on a dissected, like. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. So my one like thing that I I'm concerned about is is like it can we this is like very much on the surface of the of the. Of the mouse that they're looking at, mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't detract the the cool thing of actually like, oh wow, they they're staring it down different forks in blood vessels mm -hmm. and different areas. Uh, I mean, that's this is this is really cool technology. Um, uh, the the only issue is that uh, as long it, if it's just a surface, then then we can learn a lot using mouse models, but it might be difficult to apply to humans because we're much bigger, and so if there's like a meat a square law rule that ha happens. That means that th these kinds of surface blood vessels will be a lot less accessible in humans, and right. e even deep blood vessels might be less accessible. So uh, the it might be limited based on that, but that really depends on the acoustic technology. Because if that ultrasound technology gets more like refined, 
then actually it could be really interesting to see what can happen with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, wouldn't be just see, going through the crazy imagination of like we can move these these bacteria to ex the exact places we want them to, and yeah, <laughs> it's a, move them to a tumor. When I'm watching the tumor. watching these videos, actually makes me think of stents, <laughs> right? Like. Like, what like if, yeah, yeah, what if the like bacteria could like vessels. solidify themselves or something into <laughs> to a stent? <laughs> then you could just like deliver, right? You just get injected with these particles and then, you know, focus them using oh, the ultrasound and yeah, assemble like, into <laughs> something like that. An injectable surgery to, uh, to happen with. So you have these particles yeah. and you've got like a plaque that you know it, and these particles will deliver something. They'll dissolve the plaque and right, right. then you've got like right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's really fascinating. And, and actually, you know, I think a lot of, I was talking to somebody recently who had surgery and they're saying like, a lot of surgery is done, right, with like very little intervention, right? You want to push for that because more cutting open yeah. is more chances of infection. And so being able to, you know, do this remote manipulation is, is a pretty powerful tool, not just for, you know, delivering cancer fighting bacteria to a tumor, but like maybe even, um, yeah, just other sorts of surgery. Yeah, stuff. if you literally can inject something, then you don't need to have to take someone take up a hospital bed. You you don't need mm. to have to spend this... Most of that recovery time is because someone's cut open a massive hole in you, and you need time to, to recover, and if you have like, the, the, the there's so many, so many savings that you can have with this kind of surgery, not just the, the whole amazing technology, but also, you can literally go in for an afternoon, have this done to like, fix your heart, and then go out and, and oh, do whatever yep. you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Get another heart attack. Uh, have a giant, <laughs> giant Big Mac, and then you'll be fine. It's. I'm not um, advising people. Yeah, anyways, that. but 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 the uh, but the but the take home the sort of the big application they they tried out at the end of this paper is they also were able to make these gas vesicles in a type of salmonella that I guess is supposed to be quite good about dealing with mouse tumors, yeah. and then they can like focus the that salmonella into this specific mouse tumor and show that they get some good results. <laughs> Yeah, I think it is almost the default thing for these sort of things to to sh to test out whether they can kill cancer because everybody <laughs> hates cancer. I mean, yeah, yeah, cancer can go suck one. I mean, we're we're not, <laughs> we're not fans of cancer here. So uh -huh. yeah, uh, and the models themselves are pretty good good demonstrations of that. I mean. But yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I think it just click, it checks off boxes for people because it's like, oh, that's like a in vivo sort of thing. You have to deal with all these variables about being in an organism. But uh, yeah, anyways, that's just the capstone they put in. I, I am just fascinated with the whole concept of like, again, like in general, actually trying to manipulate bacteria that's being injected into our blood. Like I, I, I'm still reeling a little bit from from that, that idea, but it does seem like it has potential for a lot of different medical applications. So. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm wondering where the competing technologies, which one will be useful for what things, and then maybe again, like try to challenge people to think, like maybe think outside the box as well. Like, does this have to be biomedical? Maybe there's some other really interesting ways. What about like moving tattoos? <laughs> I don't know, moving tattoos. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah fashion. Die in those blood vessels and have them up and like have glowing tattoos, and they. I mean, there's <laughs> all sorts of like cool like concepts that we can do with, with this. <laughs> Uh, blood vessels? That sounds horrible. <laughs> I mean, that's what tattooing is, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, we'll cover a tattoo. Staining maybe dermal at some cells. Point. Tattoos are like, I've read a bunch of books. It's like ink, right? It's ink under the skin. It's not like in blood vessels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, not a tattoo habit, so I'm not really. Uh... <laughs> All right, let's not let's move experience. on to our next paper. <clears throat> Discovery of novel emission traits by evolution of synthetic co-cultures. Mm, yeah, so we've talked about directed evolution before um, a little bit. It's like one of the Nobel Prize and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, like people have figured out that if you set up some conditions and then iterate over them like multiple times, you can get uh, if the conditions are set up right, you can accentuate certain features of, of what you're evolving. Yeah, so that like, let's pause on this image. I think it's a good one. So this is this is that idea that they've set up a system that can constantly grow up something to high density, and then they take a little bit of that and they put into the next one, and it grows up again to high density. That's yeah. Um, this is done by a robot. That's the thing that is fascinating me about this. Mm, mm hmm. That's right. I mean, I think that that's the big. That's where we're seeing um, like uh, 
a lot of help, mm. <laughs> right? Like from robotics, because this would take so much labor potentially to do. But when we have robotic systems, it, it, it shortens that loop. Mm. And you can just like put it in the machine and then see what comes out of it at the end. And so that's essentially what this, um, this paper is about, is that what, they, what they're hoping to find is they're hoping to find a co-culture that's working better together over time. And so they have one bacteria that can make alanine, or sorry, arginine, mm. but not leucine. And they have another bacteria that can make leucine, but not arginine. And the thought process behind that is this is like forcing a division of labor. I think we may have talked about that before, like yeah. syn syntrophy. I think we saw it in like trying to control the production of something complicated. Yeah. It's sort of nice to have one complicated thing made in one area and a second complicated thing made in a second area. Then they just share those products between each other. Um, so you don't have to, you know, your metabolism doesn't, can just focus on the one thing that you're asking it to do better instead of having to do everything better. Yeah, and this is a Henry Ford of bacterial production lines. Just hey, it is. Henry it Ford, is. Yeah, it create is. this thing. We'll just have a bunch of like less skilled workers who can't survive on their own, and they'll create this product, <laughs> and it'll be more efficient. <laughs> yeah. Well, like hopefully, I mean, I don't want bacterial union. <laughs> How does that work into this metaphor? Oh, um, that's anyways, they take away from that happens with everything. But when they take away from what you want them to do, and they do something else, that's ah uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Th then you dump. Then you dump the whole thing and you start over again. Um, We're not so anyways, it, real union. So, so that's just agreed. Agreed. <laughs> We're talking about bacteria here, guys. Yeah. Um, okay. Fair enough. So <laughs> so they end up taking they they do see an increase in growth. Like the growth gets better over time, which is really good for them because like that means that something's working. And so they then sequence some representative good growers that come out of that, come out of that coevolution, and they say, what mutations do these things have? Um, and so then it, I mean, in some, the figures are not like so mind blowing. I think when no. you see these <laughs> in this whole paper, but like the approach, I think, was quite interesting because then they figure out like what is doing the work here, and they try to introduce those mutations into a clean background because mm -hmm. right when they have these. Um, ev directed evolution experiments, all sorts of mutations are accumulating, right? And so they'd like to then, once you learn what those mutations are, then they introduce them independently into different backgrounds and see, like, can they replicate the effects, right? Are these mutations sufficient right. for producing um, producing the, the increase in growth that they see? Um, yeah, and they end up learning a couple different things about, like, transporters and antiporters and things that are just, like, increasing the efficiency of the system. Um, and that's all I got. I think that's all I want to say. It's kind of yeah. a, not an easy paper. Without diving in like figure by figure to the paper, it's hard to summarize what's gone on. But essentially, like that's that's what I want to communicate today is that they doing directed evolution and then diving into every gene one by one, like what's changed, gives us a, like it's an engineering approach essentially to try to make better yeah. um, uh, to make better bioreactors that can produce like a single molecule by offloading other molecules into other bacteria. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, this is a great paper. Also, like, just demonstrating how technology can, ex isn't taking scientists' jobs, it's expanding how much we can do mm. in a paper. Mm. And this is a real, really amazing kind of technology. Yeah, but also, like, at the this. same time, it's not supplanting, like, this old school genetic approach, right? <laughs> like, where once you get after no. the genetic, after you done the direct evolution you still have to parse apart what works and they do find mutations that they don't know how they work right in the backgrounds when they sub them in it doesn't work out like it's no there's no increase in fitness and so like oh there could be more complicated dynamics like only when they have this other mutation together and i mean this is something that we've known forever about genetics right it's like it's never just one gene one phenotype right things are working in concert together um so yeah this is just a whole other like <laughs> realm of discovery but you know with more of like an industrial output in mind that that they're doing things yeah all right and uh, next next paper mm -hmm. peptidomimetic peptide antibiotics disrupt the lipopolysaccharide tra transport bridge of the drug resistant enterobacteria cia um <laughs> Lots of stumbling blocks there. That, lots of them. Yeah, lots of very long words. I didn't think 
didn't think I'd have a trouble saying until I started saying them. And then, oh, oh no. Um, <laughs> so this is in that search uh, for yeah. things that are going to help us out of this antimicrobial resistance issue. <laughs> uh, yeah, mm -hmm. this is... <clears throat> Yeah, this is an interesting one paper about uh, an antibiotic called uh, uh, let me thanatin. Yes, so they they found this antibiotic called thanatin. Uh, the only issue with it is that it isn't very bioavailable, so it can kill off bacteria, but it can't really be used as a treatment because it doesn't. It, the thing we want for any treatment is for uh, for it to be able to distribute throughout, throughout the body and go to where it's needed. And this version of the drug didn't necessarily do that. And, and like so this work paper is not only very like small concentrations, right? Like you don't want to have to like give yeah. people like milligram levels of something in their blood in order for it to work. Like people want it to work at a smaller. Uh... Yeah. So this is about like almost in figuring out how this bacteria works and kind of engineering to be a better version of that. Yeah, how this antibiotic so works they're... from from the structural perspective. Like they're really taking a structure lens to this. Yeah. Um, so they've got like a. Yeah, they definitely look at... They, so the first thing they oh, did oh, wait, was they may look I, at the compound itself. May I interject? I, Sorry? I don't want to interject. Yeah, I just want to say, like, so this antibiotic, why, why it is interesting is because it's targeting a pathway that we don't typically think of as where antibiotics would target, right? Like, there's all sorts of different... Mm -hmm. Everything... The whole idea of finding new antibiotics is, like, to target different pathways, things that bacteria need to survive. So this one is in for gram negatives, where, like, they have to, like, move their lipotechoic acid to their outer membrane. And so mm. if they block it, then, you know, some intermediates pile up in the bacteria and they die. So that's, I just wanted to say that. Uh, that can yeah, that, yeah, that's a very important thing. Because we, some of the antibiotics target the lipotychoic acid, mem the lipotychoic acid, usually in the membrane or peptidoglycan. Yeah. They, we target the bacterial cell walls. And, and gram negative bacteria have like, two bacterial cell walls that are available to target. And this one kind of targets the bridge in between them, which is uh, something that, yeah, it's an, um, it's an amazing target. That's something that isn't found in, in mammals. So it's, in, it's one that's probably not going to be toxic. Yeah, and, and also all of these gram negatives have it. So like, that's also a really good, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is typical so, for searching for things. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering like, right, like this came up in the, one of the popular deep dives that we did, the AI derived antibiotics or whatever, right? Yeah. Like when they sifted through all that diversity, they found a molecule and it, oh, it works in this different pathway that we hadn't thought of before. So, you know, this is like a whole bunch of work goes into identifying, for example, thanatin in this circumstance. But then after yeah. that point, there has to be more work done and they call it medical chemistry in this paper, right? Or medicinal chemistry yeah. to like optimize it for, can we actually even use it? <laughs> Yeah, they literally break it down into its active components and then work out how those active components bind into those aspects of the the LPT bridge, they call it. Mm -hmm. And and based on that knowledge, they, they try to isolate products that bind to that bridge better. And they also look at, uh, well, they, they apply it to live bacteria to see, see what kind of resistance appears. Mm -hmm. So they find like that there's one particular mutation that can confer resistance, and then they they shift the way they design the drug to also target that resistance as well. Yep. So that even if that, that mutation comes up, this drug can still bind and kill the bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, so, it, I like this actually as the segue from the last one, because it's again, like that idea of like thinking about evolution, right. And like taking the lessons right. that we see in some sort of evolution experiment and then re applying them outside of that experiment. Right. And saying, okay, well, if something evolves to do that, let's design outside of that. Right, a way in which that it wouldn't be effective. So now, there's two barriers to overcome uh, if if this drug would have become useful uh, for for therapeutics. Yeah, and I think understanding how this binds to its target and the area it can also like open up avenues for other drugs to be to, to be tested to see whether they can attack this area. Because that's the exciting thing about whenever you find an antibiotic that works in a new way, it opens up a way for you to try and look at other ways to attack that, that part of the bacterial metabolism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like just setting up, essentially setting up a bunch of screens now using this, um, this lipotechoic acid transport mechanism, right? And saying, what molecules have we seen yeah. in the world that work on this? We may find other ones that have different shapes that also, um, yeah, give us insights into maybe how to design uh, inhibitors better. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, speaking of like 
uh, killing off bacteria. <laughs> Why not use other bacteria to kill off bacteria? Yeah, Bedella uh, Vibrio. It's, it's, I, it's funny that it's being pitched as... I guess maybe not funny. It's maybe very understandable that people are saying, oh, this would be a great way to deal with other bacteria because it's a bacteria that eats bacteria. Um, I actually mm. saw, like, in this past four weeks, there was a CryoEM article that came out with Bedella Vibrio, like, like mashing against Ooh. a cell. But it was behind a paywall. <laughs> and I'm like, no, oh. they're sweet CryoEM images. <laughs> I wanted to see them. Um, <laughs> Anyways, yeah, it happens. Yeah, it happens. So, anyways, uh, Patella Vibrio, we talked about it a little bit before. It, it's another gram, it's a very small gram negative, a little Vibrio guy. Um, it like uh, gains entry into gram negatives, it uh, replicates in the paraplast and creates this like specific uh, replicate of vacuole called the Bedelloplast. Essentially, um, you know, all of the cell cytoplasm uh, supports growing the Bedella Vibrio instead. Um, and then in, it, it creates like a, people have seen in the past in E. coli, it makes sort of like a, a whole chain inside of the bedelloplast, and then it all segments off and bursts out of the cell. That's, that's the way it replicates. Um, but, you know, this is not just for E. coli, this is theoretically for any gram negative. And so in this paper, they uh, have it infect like a whole uh, panel of different gram negatives of different sizes. And um, and they kind of see like oh it actually like it has different growth dynamics in different sizes which maybe isn't um, so surprising but is something that people haven't spent the time to look at yet and so this paper is going to go in and show us a little bit of that um, oh yeah so in this image I think they have so they work with some um, Bedella vibrios that have uh, some markers for chromin like I think they're looking at like par B and fit C which is a uh, like the cell plane division marker. Um, and so, yeah, so I think in, in these images, we're seeing how it gets in. It kind of makes uh, a kind of a longer section and the chromosomes do partition, right? I think I think that's what we're seeing in this one. Yeah. It'll ha yeah, it'll it'll happen soon. Side. There it goes. And then do we see yeah. them pop up um, at the end. The yeah, you see. Yeah, I mean, this is like over quite a long time frame. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes it pops out in between the, the cameras. Mm -hmm. the, but yeah, there are a couple of like videos like that. Yeah, and so, so the yeah. mystery here is like, what is governing? Like, how, how do these chromosome replications happen when, when they make small amounts of this chain or when they make like a really long chain that can become three or four different cells? Um, and so, yeah, they're really just watching and, and trying to observe these differences. And so they do think that um, in, the, in the cells that can only support like two, a chain that's only two bacteria long, that is a fundamentally different type of replication process than when they can, re re when they can support like four or five of them together. And they see that in the way that these, um, these chromosome partitioning things, uh, how they're moving around inside of inside of the cell yeah so i mean they think this video has like a it going up into more than, so you've got these chain of like cells that aren't infected and then this kind of splits into like four or five and sometimes like when the cells are right next to each other one of the cells immediately just barrels into another one mm -hmm. that's right next door i think you see that with this where they just immediately just infect the next cell along the chain yeah um yeah, so and then you can see that I think it's like really cool to watch these these images, right, of the infectious cycle happening. You know, it's not something we can really see with phages, but we can see it with uh, bacteria. It's the right size. <laughs> it's the right size for this type of stuff. Um, yeah. And and I think well, the authors say that what would be useful about this paper is also just knowing that there's different ratios um, of <laughs> different ratios of um, uh, Bedella Vibrio to kill different amounts of, uh, depending on the size of those bacteria, different amounts of those. That's kind of maybe part of the therapeutic application here. But I actually think that at the end of the day, this paper is maybe more about learning about these like fundamental ideas of like chromosome partitioning inside of inside of organisms. They talk a lot about the model of Colobacter. Um, which has like a mother cell that kind of like splits off swarm or daughter cells and like how cell cycle is kind of learned from that uh, from that system. And so this is like another system that you can sort of learn about 
um, yeah, these like different chromosome partitioning uh, elements. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because like usually like with bacteria, it's either like bi binary fission or they crop partition in in multiple ways. But you never see a bacteria that does both, and that's what pro mm -hmm. protein uh, not Bedel Vibrio does. Uh, um, yeah, but Delavibri does. But I mean, it also is a super unique lifestyle, right? Like where it has to grow inside of cells. And you like it makes a lot of sense that different size cells are going to have different growth patterns inside of it because it's not a one size fits all thing. Um, and I'd been thinking about Bedella vibrio just because I think it's a really interesting cell. It's a really interesting organism, but also because mm -hmm. like it has all these ways of interacting with peptidoglycan because it has to burrow into cells. And so like, that's really cool. I think yeah. that's the last time we spoke about it was like, oh, all these different ways that it like digests peptidoglycan. Um, it's just a really interesting bug. And I'm glad that we have more images of it and we have a better understanding of how it grows inside of different cells. Yeah, uh, that brings us to the next paper. Oh, uh, next paper is really interesting. Uh, <laughs> identifying the core genome of the nucleus forming bacteria Phage family and characterization of Owenia phage ray. Yeah, I didn't even know, but there there are a subset of bacteriophages that produce a nucleus-like structure inside of the bacteria, um, and yeah. So in this paper, they say, okay, well, let's like this. I guess it's a relatively new discovery, and so they they haven't yet reconciled against all of the different phage genomes they have. Just searching for what the commonalities could be. Right? What are what's the core what's the core set of genes required to make this phage nucleus? And so they have some idea of it. It's like, well, it needs a capsid. It needs um, chamolin, which I think is like maybe making the surface of the mm. nucleus. But it also needs like um, mm. I think food. There's some sort of microtubule like thing that they also make. Um, and so like they yeah. go through all these different phage genomes. They have the ones that they know make the nucleus structure and the ones that they don't. And they try to just like sift out. Like, what's the core genome there? And then what I, the, really the part that I found most fascinating about this, because I know nothing about these phages, is they go yeah. in and they tag a bunch of these core genome genes that they're saying, like, are <laughs> probably necessary for making the nucleus. And they see, what does that look like during infection, right? And where, like, what does this nucleus look like? And specifically, I think they've chosen a phage that maybe hasn't been well studied yet, this Erwinia rate. Right. Phage. Um, and so, yeah, so you can see uh, in figure B, right, like they have the chamolin makes this like, that's the nucleus, that small green circle is this phage protein that they've tagged with GFP. And the DAPI staining shows that inside the middle of that, there's a bunch of DNA and the host uh, nucleoid has kind of been like pushed to either side of the nucleus. Yeah. <laughs> that's just... Um, yeah, and this is where phage replication happens. And again, there's like a bunch of different, this is not the first time they've been discovered. This is the first time I've seen it. And so like, there's all these things yeah. that I didn't know about it before. And now that I know, so apparently it rotates, <laughs> the nucleus slowly rotates. Um, and the phage capsids dock to the surface of it. So they're able to confirm like by staining with the capsid protein that yes, the capsid is docking. And then when they see the capsids like kind of moving around in a circle, they can measure the, the speed of the rotation of the nucleus. Um, so it's a very descriptive, but like this is stuff that people have figured out before in this phage and they're just characterizing this particular Erwinia phage in, in the system. Um, yeah, it's... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Faz. I know, it's interesting, like, this is like a phage organelle, like, we kind of, we saw, explore something similar to this with SARS-CoV-2, but this mm. is, like, much more defined, and that, and has a much more, like, visible and cool function. Yep, um, well, no, well, in SARS-CoV-2, and that's common with a lot of membrane-bound viruses, right, like, they're working yeah. in eukaryotic systems, they have, like, all the cell membrane, they have all that vesicle infrastructure, right? The Golgi apparatus and how it has all those like gradations of membrane bubbles inside of it. That doesn't exist yeah. inside of bacteria, right? Exactly. In, in the same way. And so the way it deployed, yeah, the way that these organisms or these phage deployed is like, yeah, these like self-assembled proteinaceous structures. It actually reminds me of the bacterial micro compartments, right? Those are also yeah. thought to be like phage proteins that assemble into these isolated structures the organelles of bacteria, if you will. But I guess like there's, there are also ones that assemble much larger structures that um, are full of DNA and help the phage like segregate its DNA from the rest of the thing. Um, they also had this hypothesis that they came to in this paper um, when they were doing their bioinformatics, 
they saw that there hmm. wasn't a lot of um, horizontal gene transfer between these different phage groups that they were finding. And so right. they were wondering, maybe that's one of the functions of the phage nucleus, is that it prevents recombination between when you have multiple phage infections. Um, I, they would be in their isolated nucleus, and so they wouldn't like rec recombine with yeah those other infecting phages. I, I don't know. That's again, they're just like speculating think, a little bit here. <laughs> but that that is an interesting aspect because I mean the idea of having the phage DNA. I mean it like CRISPR. It kind of like it, it can prevent CRISPR can potentially activating on that. It can also prevent mm. recombination. So uh, the idea of like sometimes when a phage recombines recombines with the host. It, it messes up for any other phage that it tries to infect. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, like so preventing the lysogeny part, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like because um, I remember there's that that paper of like two phages that are infecting uh, a single like quote, bacteria that were fighting against each other because yes. they uh, subsequently integrating in, into each other. Like it kind of it feels like part of that level of battle on the gene level. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is like a tool for different phage, right? Like that they could potentially like draw a boundary between them and some other phage so that they can have better fitness or whatever for whatever reason. Yeah. So, I mean, what I don't really get a sense from is whether this nucleus structure they, they describe is similar to like the eukaryotic nucleus mm. and whether it says anything about another endosymbiotic event being... Because it doesn't seem like it's similar to like the what we think of... Because when I first read this, I thought, oh my gosh, they've solved how the nucleus was created in oh. the dawn of life. And then I read through it and go, oh no, this is they just called it that. It's just the name. It yeah, really they just call it that. I don't think it's anymore. like a nucleus at all. Like, nucleus has, like, that huge pore structure, right, that is, like, really yeah. very complicated and serves a function of, like, what goes out and what comes in. Um, this one, it doesn't sound like they have pores like that. Like, the capsids are docking no. to the proteinaceous surface and getting filled. But, I mean, there's still, like, all sorts of weird mechanisms there, at, like, that I'm totally fascinated about. I want to learn more. I'm sure everyone wants to learn more yeah. who's studying these things. Oh. Like, also, why yeah. does the nucleus rotate? I <laughs> just, like, and, like, and like yeah. what's the mechanism of that action? Like, it sounds like it's part of this, like, F, uh, PF, P, anyways, this, like, microtubular, like, protein they have. Um, like, right? So there's all this stuff that's going on that's just, like, a... Mm whole mess of diversity that I hadn't thought about before. <laughs> yeah, we just have to think about how to turn this into a treatment for something, and then we'll get more research. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and just studying them in general. I mean, again, like, bacterial microcompartments, people were interested in them because, like, they could segregate out different biochemical functions inside of a, a space. So, like, I mean, I think that that's relevant here as well, right? Segregating out different biochemical functions inside of this particular structure. Um, yeah. So, but, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that's cool. Uh, <laughs> next paper. Next paper. Bacterial DNA on skin surface overrepresents the viable skin microbiome. Mm -hmm. And the thing that stood out to me is in this important study in bold, authors <laughs> provide convincing evidence that current DNA microbial genomics for a skin bacteria cannot always detect the source of sequence DNA. And yes. this is. Uh, I, I like angry papers. Uh. Yeah, no, I, I liked it because it was an angry paper, too. And also because, like, I've ingested so much of the skin microbiome stuff. Like, I, yeah. in grad school, I was growing skin, and I was putting bacteria on the surface, right? So, like, I wanted to understand how that related to the actual reality of bacteria on the skin in the wild. And the only information that I really had on that was these microbiome studies, right? Because it's just hard to get biopsies, I believe. And, and... And, and the tool of doing a microbiome study was like very accessible. All you have to do is swab things and then sequence a whole bunch of it. And all of a sudden you have this inventory of everything that's presumably alive and living on the surface. But what these authors do is that they just are so much more careful and that they looked at a bunch of biopsies and they're like, there's something weird here. Like we don't see a lot of bacteria just sitting on the surface of our biopsies. So they're using a fish mm. probe, they're using a, um, a 16S ribosomal, right, like fish probe here. Um, fish not being like the organism fish, like fluorescence in situ <laughs> uh, hybridization. Hybridization. Yeah. So in some ways, that's the same principle as doing these 16S studies, right? Like they're looking for the presence of 16S bacteria, uh, 16S sequences, but like spatially on the surface. And uh, I think this was already well known. At least, I mean, the authors make it sound like 
people didn't think about this before, but like when I was reading the literature, everyone was thinking about it. Like the the hair follicles are holes and and they have all the sebum and stuff, right? So like there are more nutritional yeah. zones for bacteria to live in. There's more bacteria there than on the surface. Um, and that's what they see inside of these um, in, inside of these biopsy stains that they have. But what that opens up is this question of like, so then why do we get so much bacteria when we just swab the surface? Um, and the hypothesis they go after is maybe they're not viable, right? They're dead in some way. Um, hmm. And so they come up with this technique um, where they use a dye a P called PMA. And hmm. uh, what the dye can do is that it doesn't go through membranes. Um, and then when they irradiate it, it can cross link to any DNA that it's associated with. So when they apply this dye onto the surface of the skin, um, you know, they have like a version where they don't apply it and they, a version where they do. And so in the version where they do, it's going to get into all those broken up cells and get and get cross-linked to their DNA, meaning that it's going to be that DNA will be inaccessible to the sequencing technique. And so by comparing mm. the pool of sequencing they got when they didn't apply the dye and the pool of sequencing they got when they did apply the dye, theoretically, they'd be sifting out all of those like sort of broken up cells that just have genomes lying around because all of that would yeah. be made inactivated by the dye. Yeah. And, and so they, then they get an idea oh, of oh, like oh, what, because oh. like because I feel like we've we've covered studies before which have like sampled the skin mm -hmm. and you get a diversity of bacteria and you get all the Shannon diversity indexes to mm -hmm. see like oh how and this kind of calls all that into question because essentially it's saying that there's a lot of that 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 stuff comes from dead bacteria mm -hmm. and we can't necessarily say whether they're they're residents or not they just could be very trans so like they talk about this ongoing effect of like how. The skin microbiome is very stable over long periods of time, but then very unstable over short periods of time. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, they try to resolve that here by going like, well, actually, a lot of those instability comes from transient bacteria that aren't there. They, they go on the skin and they die immediately because the skin is a barrier to all bacteria. So I could touch on the bacteria and it will die on my skin, but then it'll still come become positive on DNA samples. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, so they they end up generating this um, this uh, oh, oh my god, it's called a it's a score. It starts with viability score, right? Like because they're mm -hmm. essentially getting a measurement of uh, like what's viable versus what isn't. And like I want to look at Figure Four because I think to me this is like the this is the figure that I'm sort of going to be remembering. Um, from this yeah. paper. Okay, let's go. Because yes. In figure four, they take that viability score and they place it against all of the different, um, all of the different uh, like taxa of bacteria that they have, and they get a sense of is it underrepresented or overrepresented based on its mm. viability, right? Um, and so they get a sense. So if things are uh, yellow, I think closer to one is. Oh my gosh, I've lost my notes. I think close to one is like they're represented fairly and then blue and gray, it means that they're actually not viable, if mm -hmm. I understand it correctly. Yeah, no, it's like um, it's uh, like one side is overrepresented and one side is underrepresented. <laughs> hmm. uh, sorry, it's horrible for me. Um, so they're looking at PMA 1.3. Okay. Oh, sorry. This is dead time here. Anyways, it's, it's, the, yeah. the, I think the blue is underrepresented. Like closer mm -hmm. to zero is being, oh, sorry, closer to zero is being overrepresented. So, like, yeah. most things are overrepresented. That makes sense. But there are things also yeah. that, like, are a little bit underrepresented. That's the yellow bit, right? So, like, there are things yeah. that we hadn't been thinking about before as being part of the skin microbiome but actually are in certain areas because they're the more viable ones in, in those specific regions. And I think to me, that was what I'm, that what I found so much so fascinating about this is like, it really calls into like, we have a more nuanced understanding actually of the skin where before we just said, there's tons of stuff there, all this crazy, this PMA me metric actually gives us like a really nice, I don't know, to me, it makes a much more clearer image of like what bacteria are actually doing on the skin. It's not just like a, there is some specificity perhaps, right? To where certain things want to live and where certain things, not just that everything's, you know, distributed over the surface. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I really enjoyed that part of it. Um, yeah.
Yeah, and like, like no, the places are like the hair shaft is where a lot of those underrepresented bacteria live. The things that aren't easy, in easy swabbing distance. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, or like I, I mean, I guess maybe because I'm just, I've heard a lot about these different taxa in relation to the skin. It just like surprised me. Like, everyone says Karani bacterium is all over the skin, and just to know that actually it's under it's overrepresented in most areas yeah. except the nares. Like, that was something that I just found quite shocking. <laughs> but shocking yeah. in a good way, because I'm like, yeah, it's true. I never interrogated this, this fundamental thought process of, are they even alive in these areas? And having this data, like, yeah, builds a picture of the skin that is just way more complete. <clears throat> yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, so that brings us to our final paper, which is, ooh, this is a juicy one. Uh, Biomineralize. <laughs> Biomineralization of coral sand by Baculus thuringiensis, uh, isolated from a travertine cave. I understand yeah. I mispronounced it thuringiensis there, but <laughs> fine. Uh, yeah, this bacillus, I feel like people talk about this bacillus as like a biocontrol agent. Like it's the one that makes like um, the BT toxin. This is, yeah, this is BT toxin from BT oh, core. Yeah. Um, but anyways, I guess it does other things too. Specifically, uh, in this paper, they found a, a cave that had some crud growing on its surface, and they chipped away at it and said, oh, I bet this, or maybe this was made by some microbial action. So they ground up that rock and tried to isolate bacteria out of it, and sure enough, there's um, a bacillus that comes out, and uh, they end up using that bacillus in, uh, to try to make bacterial concrete. Um, and so bacterial concrete is made uh, by the deposition of, well, I guess there's a lot of different ways. The one that they're looking at here is calcium carbonate deposition uh, mm. with urea metabolism. So they have to provide urea and calcium as sort of the food. And then they have the substrate is, um, is coral sand. Yeah, this is the picture of the setup that they use. So they have, um, they essentially fill up this uh, porous mold full of uh, sand. And, and this is not coral sand, this is coral sand. So it's made of calcium carbonate, uh, which is the same material that these bacteria end up making. And so they fill this with coral sand, and then they, uh, they essentially water it with a mixture of bacteria and urea. I think they have a flow chart. Ah, oh, yeah, this flow chart. Yeah. They essentially water it uh, with bacteria and a mixture of urea and calcium chloride. Um, and as they, they do that uh, seven times, and then they end up solidifying that plug of sand. They also do it 14 times to, you know, see the difference between between the two. And then the rest of this paper mm. dives into um, a bunch of like engineering things where they're like testing the material properties of this um, of this concrete that comes out, and uh, and also doing like some SEM analysis to see like uh, like uh, where are the linkages being made between the different um, the different granules. I think that, yeah, I think that image, this is some sort of NMR, maybe? Uh, oh, right, yeah, that's, let's look where the water content is. Yeah. To see, like, the pool size based off of that. Exactly, uh, exactly. The EM is here. And the EM is uh, here, right? So, again, th this is, like, these are just ways of physically characterizing the material. Um, and I think this way of making, it's, it's, reading this paper, what it made me realize is there's many different ways of going about microbial concrete. Um, like yeah. one of the ways that I've heard of is like this like self-healing version, right? Where you embed organisms into it. But um, yeah, there's also like like thinking about like what the production mechanism would be like to adhere a bunch of sand together. Uh, that there's like this insight that this paper brings, and they basically did like a bioprospecting, right? Where they said, look at this hard hmm. substance that we found in nature. Maybe we can make it too. But I think that's because I think in the place that they found it, they found it in like this this tunnel where there's like a giant crack, and the bacteria had filled up the crack, so it's almost naturally self healing. Uh huh. And so that's a great place to try and find a self heating con concrete, and then use that almost as a building material to have that concreting process happen between sand particles. So like, because concrete has like a chemical process at the moment, but the idea of turning that into a biological process of concreting something is. Uh, a new idea that I thought was quite yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's supposed to be like, right, there's all that, the center or whatever in regular in regular concrete, and the cement in regular center is like an incredibly carbon intensive process. 
So, I mean, there, yeah. there's research being done to try to reduce the amount of carbon that that center takes to make. And then on the other side, there's like, why don't we just rethink concrete? Like concrete is just like an aggregate that's being bound together. Maybe we can find other ways to bind those things, those that aggregate together to make. Bacteria love biofilms and they love growing in groups and yeah. binding together essentially. So yeah, it's been identified that there's a bunch of bacteria that can, that can do this process. I always see it being urea. Uh, has been a really common mm. a common thing, but I'm not really sure if it's mm. always calcium carbonate that is the that is sort of the mineral deposit that ends up being uh, precipitated by by the bacteria. I just I don't know enough about the field. <laughs> yeah, I mean microbiology hits so many different fields. I mean we've seen that here, like we've got medical field, we've got had uh, veterinary fields, we had but various biotechnologies mm. and. Uh, in, in now like building materials so yeah there's a lot here yeah I mean that cat one was basically like, like very cat biology estrus cycle focus there was a lot of like hormones over time and seeing like how that shifts so yeah in some ways some of the papers I feel like we choose are just like bacteria are just the sprinkling on top of what is another field's work essentially and, and they're just being used as like workhorses to try to get get stuff done but at the same time like you know, there's so much we don't know about the bacteria that we're even using. And like that, learning about their lifestyles can unlock new ways of thinking about using them, right? And that can like touch on like, for example, like the phage nucleus and the Bedello Vibrio, right? Like yeah. Those are just stuff like learning about how this stuff works in its normal life. But like that ends up unlocking other ways of like using those uh, microbes in our own <laughs> processes that we want to take control over. <clears throat> Yeah, bacteria are truly are great things that are small. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think that so, brings us to the end of us. Yeah, that's the end. And um, I think Faz and I have been talking about trying to take the summer off <laughs> uh, and maybe regrouping yeah. back in the fall. So um, still keep sending, like we're still going to keep our eyes out for really interesting papers and we'll like still be updating the Zotero probably in that respect. Um, mm. But we'll be back in the fall at some point. So, you know, tune into our Mastodon. I mean, I'm primarily on Mastodon these days. I don't cross post that much to Twitter that more just because I have to log in there explicitly. Um, so, yeah. yeah so. It's kind of on fire at the moment. <laughs> so so. Like, subscribe to the YouTube channel for sure and, and check out our Mastodon. We'll announce when we're going to come back. But but we still want to come back and, and, and continue doing these. We just think that it would be nice to have a, a little bit of a break during the summer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've been going at this for since 2020, basically. And <laughs> this was our pandemic. Been... This is our pandemic project. <laughs> this is our pandemic project. And I think now that we're like, we, we're used to things and things aren't so hectic on the SARS-CoV-2 mm. side, uh, we don't need to have that impetus to talk about every single story as they come yeah. out, which is what we used to have. <laughs> and we want to experiment uh, now with the format basically... too, I think like thinking about different ways that we're putting together this content. And so taking some time off will also be some time for us to think about how to put it together, maybe in a different way. Yeah. And I'm probably going to go back and like chop out some of the best, best bits from previous shows and then release those over time. Because I think I'm really starting to realize that having to sit through a whole one hour <laughs> and 10 can be quite demonic for people, especially when there's sun outside <laughs> and that you need to, and I'm feeling that as well. So uh, chopping out some of the best bits so people can, can see what, what what works, and so we can get a better idea of what papers you want to see, mm. and then we can uh, hopefully put progress the show further because we've always been trying to change and update things. So totally. hopefully we can do that for the future. Very excited about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, so classic sign off. We want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible that we didn't get everything right. Science about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, let us know in the comments. Yeah, we both believe that peer review is a process which we can all participate in and hope you've all had fun listening to us to ramble on about microbiology today. Uh, and if you think you have something to add, please contact us. We have many ways you can contact us in the doobly do. All right. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Same here, Faz. Oh, hey, man, rough. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, subscribe. And so that we can tell when we're producing more microbiology content. Uh, it's always been fun. Uh, enjoy making the show so much. Uh, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to find find the exit button for this quickly. Uh, <laughs> See you guys in the fall. <laughs> but yeah.